Hi guys, it's Heather. I thought I would show my face for a minute. Um, I usually film my YouTube videos in my son's bedroom and it's not a great backdrop for uh, headshots. I don't think he would appreciate it either. So <laughs> you'll be seeing a lot of my hands probably and uh, hearing my voice and not so much of my face, but I thought I would say hello. I'm out here in the rain with my dog, taking her for a walk, and um, it seemed like a good opportunity to say hi. So I wanted to thank everybody who has liked and subscribed, and uh, for the good response from my last video. I, I'm pleased that people are finding it useful. And today I'm gonna share um, probably a little bit of my strategies for art making and um, show you some of my books and some of my other artwork and hopefully you'll get some tips that will help you as well. I'll see you on the inside. I'm just going to flip through some of uh, my older books and older work as I'm talking to you um, just so you're not staring at a blank screen. but. Um, one of the things that I do um, for art making, and the first thing I wanted to talk to you about, is ritual. Um, it can be helpful to set the mood uh, as you're entering the studio with some rituals. And one of the things that I do is um, I often make myself a cup of tea or coffee. Um, you could light a candle, you could um, maybe say a positive affirmation that you know uh, helps you mentally get into a headspace of non-judgment in regard to art making. Um, music is often a good way to set the tone and it can definitely influence your artwork. Um, more energetic music obviously might make for more energetic uh, pieces, paintings. Um, so ritual, I think, is pretty important. Uh, making sure that your needs are met before you come into the studio, your physical needs, um, your mental needs, like if you have something that you need to do in order to not be stressed out before you start making art. A phone call or whatever. Get all that out of the way. Make sure you're not hungry or thirsty. And then your your brain is in a better headspace to be making art. And the second thing that I would suggest is uh, working on your setup, your art room setup, your studio space. So for instance, I love making these little dots and linear marks on my uh, books with these uh, fine liners. These are filled with fluid acrylics and they have a needle tip. I use them very frequently in my artwork. So they are readily available within reach uh, in my studio setup. I recently had a a big studio clean out where I moved everything out that I wasn't currently using. Uh, for example, I've done oil and cold wax painting in the past and I love it. I'm probably going to go back to it, but I'm not currently using it at the moment. I'm using water-based media and just having those supplies cluttering up my studio space was kind of an impediment to uh, my art making and the other thing that I did was um, I tried to make sure that like I said all my my most used materials were within arm's reach of uh, my desk my my studio space that I use um, and then the less frequently used stuff is further away um, but having supplies in a closet far from where you're actually making the art can make it one step too hard to actually you know make the art so having a, a permanent space whether it's just a corner of a room 
or an actual studio with all your supplies in sensible places is very helpful and I think has really helped me to produce more and better um, in recent months. So one of the approaches that I take to art making, uh, especially abstract art making, is I view it as a game. Uh, now with games, games have rules. Uh, in order to make them a game, you have to have boundaries. And having rules set for yourself within your art making is super, super helpful. When there's unlimited possibilities, there's actually more stress involved because you don't know what to choose. But when you have a boundary that says, you know, you can only do it in this size or you can only use these materials, um, then it becomes a game to figure out how to make it work. And I'll show you an example of that. I did the 100 day project uh, this year and my one rule for myself was that my paper had to be six by six, uh, six inches by six inches. So I'm working in a square format. That's one rule. The size is predetermined uh, and it takes some of the stress out of figuring out what to do. I don't have to constantly be cutting paper. I can just cut a whole bunch of sheets that size and um, then I'm ready to go. So I did things like collage. It didn't really matter what I put on the paper as long as it was six by six. I did some little drawings. Um, let's see. There's some more collage pieces. And then I decided I would start doing some acrylic painting. Again, in the six by six format. Um, and I chose a limited color palette for each one of these. And I had to use a palette knife. So that was another rule that I set for myself. Um, I used scurfito, which is scratching into the paint as my line work. That was another rule. I did not use an actual pencil or pen on top of these. Um, so there were, there were certain rules within each one of these uh, pieces, but the overarching theme was that it had to be six by six. And just having that paper ready to go uh, really helped speed the process along. Then, um, after I got done with chemo, I kind of switched gears and I started doing, these are jelly printed um, with Caran d'Ache crayon and then some painting over the top with the scurfito. Uh, and that was, you know, a different set of rules but still within my parameters of six by six. And I really enjoyed that. Did a bunch of pieces. And I ended up with at least 100 and, I wanna say 150 of these small paintings, small collages. So it was a pretty successful project and it produced a lot of artwork um, and you know I didn't make it the entire time that I was going through chemo or radiation but at least I had something that I could come back to that was already set up and prepared for me. I had already cut the paper. So that was that project and, and I really do recommend having like these limits or boundaries. My current project is of course these small books and initially they started out as like the off cuts or the scrap from my jelly printing and my current rule for these is that I have to unify the two pages somehow and create a page spread. And sometimes I'm successful, 
I feel like this one's pretty successful. I like it a lot, and sometimes I'm not. Um, but it it allows for experimentation. This is a page I did the other day. Um, the colors were not my favorite on these pages, but I had stuck them in the book anyway, so I had to work with them. And what I ended up doing was cutting this middle page into strips and then kind of creating a little game out of that itself so that as you flip the pages, you can create interesting little compositions. So that's, that's how I kind of gamify the, um, the art process, or I guess how it works in my brain anyway. These become puzzles that I have to solve um, within the parameters that I set for myself. So another parameter that I set for myself is that I tend to work in the grid format. And by doing that, it has streamlined the process a bit because I can just have a bunch of strips of paper that I use to kind of uh, resolve the compositions. And I don't have to worry about cutting shapes. I may do that in the future, I've, I've done compositions or, or collages like that where they're unusual shapes, but at the moment, uh, just the stability of the grid format seems to appeal to me. And then I add stuff on top that's not necessarily grid oriented. One of the first books that I did in this type of format was this one, and it was all collage and um, like Karen Dosh or water soluble pencil. And some of them I was not really able to resolve as a um, page spread, but that was the idea that it would be a page spread that kind of worked together. Here I did some torn pieces, but most of them were cut with scissors. And again, in kind of a grid format. All right, so the next thing I wanted to talk to you about is knowing yourself. Um, it sounds obvious, but a lot of times we get influenced by what we see online or by um, teachers that we have taken classes from. And deep in your heart, I know that there are certain things that, at least for me, they really create this sense of rightness. And, and then there's other things that are okay, but they don't resonate with me. So for instance, I like this page on the front cover of this book. It's pretty cool, but it does not resonate internally as much as these colors, um, the vibrance, and it may be different for you. You may just love the muted tones and, um, you know, it, it just may really be your thing. But knowing that can set you on your art path uh, a lot faster. So there are several ways to kind of explore that. Um, I'm just going to flip through this book as I'm talking. One of them is to utilize the internet. Uh, you don't want to spend all your time on that, but looking at art by other people, and if you can save it in some way, the, the pieces that really are, you know, the colors you like, the patterns you like, the style that you like, uh, is helpful, then you can have kind of these mood boards that, um, you can utilize in your own work. A Pinterest is a great way to do that. Instagram is a great way to do that. You can save stuff in both of those places. Um, exploring historical artwork is another way to do that. Um, 
And then just as you're making, mentally thinking to yourself, do I like this? What do I like? Being, being specific, maybe taking notes about the color that really makes you happy or the fact that something doesn't make you happy um, is going to help you grow as an artist. And when I say, um, you know, these evaluations are important, it's not a judgmental thing where you're like, oh, I make terrible art, I hate that, I'm not happy with that. It's more like, oh, this is interesting, or this is, um, I love this color, or this color combination will, will be super helpful. In regard to the judgment part of art making, um, sometimes we make things that we really don't like. And this is a page that I just feel like was a total disaster. <laughs> um, but, you know, in the past I probably would have said, I hate this, I'm not a very good artist, um, why can't I, I do things right? But my current way of thinking is to look at it as an experiment. And, you know, this black underneath the collage piece was my initial attempt at some drawing, and it ended up being very blobby and uh, just too much paint. And, you know, when it when it was there, I did not try and, like, wipe it out or, or do anything about it. I just evaluated it and said, that's interesting. Why did that happen? Um, so using it as an experimental place um, is helpful uh, it reduces the the angst i guess involved with making art if you can just view it as an experiment i ended up covering it up and i still feel like this page is not super successful but that's okay um, worst case scenario i could just glue those pages together but i'd rather s still be able to see this as uh, you know, an experiment that didn't go quite right and remember why I didn't like it and how to avoid that in the future. Um, a lot of people, when they're starting out making art, do not realize how much art, um, even successful artists, throw out or is not in, in their mind successful. You know, there's going to be a percentage of your artwork that you just want to toss in the bin. And um, realizing that this is a common experience for all artists, that uh, everyone from sculptors, ceramicists, painters, um, jelly printers, are going to have quote-unquote failures that they don't like. Um, and, you know, are not saleable is actually a helpful uh, mentality because it, it keeps you from being, I guess, a perfectionist. Like, I, I'm kind of a reformed perfectionist. I used to think that, you know, every artwork that I made needed to turn out well, um, and it created more stress for me. Um, it prevented me from maybe making as much art because if I felt, I felt like if I wasn't going to be successful that um, maybe I shouldn't try or something. Um, but accepting failure as part of the experience and part of the process is actually a really helpful, um, it's a very helpful mental strategy to get past some of the blockages to making art. So another idea that I wanted to talk about is um, the concept that a lot of people have about wasting art materials. Um, you already know, based on what I just said, that there's going to be art that you probably throw out, but there's still some stress involved, especially for people who aren't you know, wealthy um, about using 
art supplies because art supplies are expensive. Um, this is a book that I made out of packing paper from probably a Dick Blick shipment or Amazon or something. It's a little bit thick um, and I just jelly printed on it using uh, kind of basic paints. Uh, I might have used some of my good paints on it, but the point is that you can use kind of basic art supplies and really make some fun and interesting art. Uh, and if, if using the good stuff stresses you out and it's preventing you from making art, then find less expensive alternatives like brown paper grocery bags or um, old books that aren't very expensive. Um, and, and start making art no matter what. Uh, expect that some of it's gonna be bad and expect that you're gonna throw some of it out, but make it anyway. When I was um, first diagnosed with breast cancer back in January of this year, um, I realized that I had all these art supplies that I had never used and needed to use or my family was going to end up stuck with them if I died from this. Uh, and it became my life mission to <laughs> use up the art supplies that I had purchased. Um, Unfortunately, I'm not going to die from breast cancer, but uh, it was kind of a revelation. I'm like, what am I leaving my family with? I'm leaving them with a bunch of art supplies, not a bunch of art. And so think about that. If you have the supplies, start using them. If you don't have the supplies, start using more basic materials. Uh, you can still get good effects, interesting effects from kind of basic stuff. Um, you know, this is that mesh that I made recently out of school, uh, lined school paper that I printed on the jelly plate. So you can have a lot of fun and you can make a lot of really interesting art with very basic supplies. So I hope this has helped some of you with like the, the mental game of um, making art and that you, if you did find it useful, that you will like and subscribe. Thanks so much.